Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of this meeting. And it's really delightful to see how many of you have stayed the entire two days. Um, I can assure you we're going to end on a high note. Uh, this session, as you know, is focused on network science. And I was told to tell you a little bit about myself, so I decided to put it in the context of the theme of the session. When I first got introduced to the concept of network theory, which was about just over 10 years ago, I actually pivoted my research. I've always been working in cancer, specifically developing computational models of cancer progression. And prior to that point, I had been focusing exclusively on imaging data, clinical trial data, clinical registry data. But when I was introduced to network concepts, I realized that this was a formalism that would be able to enable me to bring in other types of data, uh, specifically cancer omics, um, and merge it together with um, the imaging data and the clinical outcomes data that had been very familiar with. And so with that, I changed really a lot of my research and moved into this direction of cancer systems biology, and since then have been part of a really growing community and a community that's been uh, actively funded by the NCI. We have a center here in cancer systems biology, and, it, and this center very much uses ideas of network theory to try to unravel the molecular mechanisms of cancer progression uh, by bringing together many types of data on many different platforms, genomic, proteomic, metabolomic, and bringing in even histological images, medical images, merging them with outcomes data. So it's a very productive framework, and so I'm really delighted to see that this meeting has embraced this uh, concept. And we have three terrific speakers. Um, really luminaries in the field. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and he has so many titles that I have to read it off a piece of paper. So <laughs> um, this is Laszlo Vasari, who is the Robert Gray Dodge Professor of Network Science and Distinguished University Professor at Northeastern University, where he directs the, network, the Center for Complex Network Research. He also has an appointment in the Department of Physics and the College of Computer and Information Science. In addition to that, he has an appointment in the Department of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School, an appointment in the Channing Division of Network Science at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and he is a member of the, cancer, the Center for Cancer Systems Biology at the Dana-Farber Institute. He's written a number of textbooks on network science have been translated into many languages, and he's known for the discovery of the concept of scale-free networks, which has been used to explain cellular telephone networks and online communication networks. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker, and we'll get, his, get him on the stage. And the title of his talk is Network Medicine from Cellular Networks to Human Disease Home. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks for staying this long. <laughs> and indeed, today we'll not be, we will not be talking about scale-free networks. We'll be talking about how to use networks to think about human diseases. And in particular, <clears throat> you know, I titled this Network Medicine. And let me start with an appropriate uh, uh, image which is to kind of think about how do we think about the disease from a network perspective. And let's start with the car. In many ways, a broken car is similar to an individual with a disease, right? But there's a fundamental difference between a car and most of our diseases. That is that, you know, if you have a broken car, you can take it to a shop and virtually guarantee that it will be fixed. And unfortunately, we cannot say that for many of our diseases. Now, the question that comes is that what m allows the mechanic with a fraction of a schooling compared to the medical doctor and the fraction of the income to that of a medical doctor to really guarantee that your car will run out healthy from the garage while we struggle so much, our colleagues in the medical school as well in the hospitals struggle so, so much to really kind of restore the health of patients. And of course, there's a fundamental difference, or many fundamental difference, between the tool set that the mechanic has and uh, the, uh, the doctor. For one thing, the, the mechanic has the parts list, right? And, and, you know, that one we cannot say so easily about the doctor, but in any way, at the molecular level, the genome project provided us the parts list. We know all the genes, hence we know all the proteins, and we know all the components that are present in the cell. What the mechanic has, however, that the doctor doesn't, is a wiring diagram. 
That is, how do these pieces fit together? Who is connected to whom and how they are connected to each other? And in many ways, <coughs> you know, this, the car would be, the mechanic would be lost if he was just given these pieces completely spread around. The reason why he can actually combine them is because the axis of this wiring diagram. So then the question we want to ask, <coughs> really, is that how do we think from the network perspective, from the connection perspective about diseases? And what I would like to tell you here is that in many ways, the, to, our understanding of disease is hidden in these molecular networks that are taking place within the cell. Now, I'm myself a physicist, I literally define myself a network scientist, and I spent much of my last 15 years looking at internet as a network, at social networks, as well as lately more and more looking at the network within the, comp uh, within the cell, that are the, the, the interactions between the components. And what you see in this image is nothing but the protein-protein interactions within the human cells in a way that you can see that. And the question I would like to ask is that how do we think about the disease in the context of this network? How do the breakdown of a component, of a gene or of a protein, leads to something that we perceive as a disease? Now, in order to see that, uh, to understand it, I'm going to show you first a network that doesn't look like a cell, but I want you to de uh, suspend this belief for a few moments, and let us agree that this is nothing but a map of a cell, where the nodes would correspond to the uh, proteins and the road segments would be the interactions between them. Now, of course, we're all familiar with this one. Most of us have actually visited this particular network. And one thing we know when we go there is that if you want to exploit this network, there are certain neighborhoods you want to go to. For example, if you want to go to theater, you don't just go anywhere, but you go to the Broadway neighborhood, a well-localized neighborhood within that. If you want to buy some high-priced artwork, you again don't just simply wander around the streets anywhere, but you go around the vicinity of the 21st Street. And the reason why is that is because the functions of Manhattan are well localized, the higher end functions in well defined neighborhoods. And, and, you know, like kind of most of the components responsible for that aggregate in that way as well. Now, what I would like to convince you in this talk is that that's the same, same is true for the cell. That is that when you look at the components that are responsible for a certain uh, function, they tend to agglomerate in a certain part of that large network I showed you earlier. And that could be called the functional module. And when that functional module breaks, will be a disease module. That is that the idea here is that the components that are responsible for a certain disease are well localized, just like Broadway's or just like the, uh, uh, the galleries are in New York. So, <laughs> so if you believe that, then we would say, you know, that cancer would be probably sitting around Wall Street. And you could put bipolar disorder around the uh, Times Square neighborhood, right? And maybe you put asthma and respiratory disease around the George Washington Bridge where Manhattan breeds much of its mass into New Jersey, right? So... <clears throat> Now, of course, if this is true, then what we have to do is very simple. Get a map, get a map of the cell, find a disease module for each disease, and then somehow drug it. But of course, it's obvious that it's not that simple. One reason it's not that simple is that we don't have a map. I mean, we do, but what we have is not a complete map. According to the current estimate, you know, about 20 to 30 percent of the interactions are known to us. The rest of it is missing. Mark Vidal, my collaborator at Dan F. Arbor Cancer Institute, has done a heroic job of mapping out these protein-protein interactions within the cell. Now, what happens if you are missing 70 percent of the interactions? Well, this is what I'm going to show you here. We're going to remove 70 percent of the links and see how we can actually recognize the disease modules. And of course, when 70% of the links uh, disappear, the map falls into pieces. And it will be a, a significant scientific challenge to find where the disease modules are. Now, in the cell, we have a little bit better situation because the cell is denser than Manhattan. The inter uh, typical protein has about 15 interactions or more, not four like a, a street segment in Manhattan. So the network gets still uh, remains connected, but still the challenge for us is how do we think about disease modules in a network that is 70% of the links are missing? Well, let me uh, illustrate that in a very particular situation in the case of asthma. Uh, and I'm going to try to start with this map, which is kind of the best map we had about a few years ago, and place on that the asthma uh, uh, proteins. Because asthma is a well-studied well uh, uh, disease, and therefore we have about 100 uh, genes that are somewhat associated with that. So we're going to go and highlight these genes on that. 
And what you see is that they tend to be agglomerate in a particular network neighborhood, and that's really the indication that there is a so-called asthma disease module. Now, not all proteins are in that neighborhood, and some of them are disconnected partly because we're missing links that would pull them there, right? Remember, 70% of the links are missing, and others are disconnected because they are probably labeled as asthma module, uh, uh, proteins, but in, I, I, they are really not that. So the question is, how can I use this information having this disease module? Well, what I suspect is that in the vicinity of these asthma proteins, the other proteins are also associated with asthma, and they're potential drug targets as well. Because as you know, most drugs don't actually target the disease genes themselves. The vast majority of drugs on the market are actually hitting proteins in the vicinity of the disease genes. They're restoring some consequences of the problems that, uh, that the mutation had. So what we do is, that, for example, develop methodologies by which we can find out the other potential uh, uh, di uh, disease genes or drug targets using different methodologies, like one of them is this diamond methodology that looks in the neighborhood and finds out what are the proteins that have a statistically significant association with the existing pr asthma proteins. And then as a result, you know, you will, what you see now is that how we are actually filling in the disease module in that neighborhood. And so our claim is that what you see here filling in is really the asthma module. That's the neighborhood you need to drug. That's the neighborhood you need to perturb in case you want to kind of un, uh, uh, cure asthma. And of course, there's nothing specific about asthma. For example, I'm, I, I have the pleasure to be part of the of One Brave Idea, and we'll be doing exactly the same thing for, for different type of heart disease, particularly coronary heart disease. And, and we have also applied it to many other diseases. Now, this is about one particular disease. How do we think about other diseases and the relationship between them? Well, for the, for the sake of concreteness, I'm going to highlight here the COPD genes. COPD is also a resp respiratory disease, you know, very similar symptoms to asthma, and unsurprisingly, the genes are in the same neighborhood where asthma is. So what we find is that, indeed, diseases that have common symptoms and common characteristics tend to be residing in the same network neighborhood. They are next to each other, often overlapping, and we can actually look at all pairs of diseases and how they connect to each other through shared genes, as well as shared network relationship, where they are close to the network. And we find that if we just simply look at the network, we know nothing about the disease and the symptoms, but we look at where they reside within this network, those that are overlapping have high comorbidity, they have common symptoms and lots of common characteristics, high co-expression and so on. Those that are in a different network neighborhood tend to have a completely different <coughs> set of properties. So, so down the line, what I would like to conclude with, <coughs> given that my time is slowly running out, is this idea that if we ever want to really understand human diseases, we cannot avoid the path to understand the networks that connect the cellular components. And this is relevant at many levels. First of all, today we characterize and we classify diseases based on the, uh, on the organs in which they emerge. We have heart disease, we have brain disease, and so on. And, and you, of course, we will continue at training neurologists and cardiologists, but I think in the future, most doctors will have to become a little bit of networkologists as well. Why is that? Because if you think about 10, 20 years into the future, a doctor will have to tell you, why is that particular mutation in your gene sequence a problem? What pathways and what network uh, uh, consequences does it have? And where in the network would you intervene to fix that problem? That is the way the, 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 the mutations manifest in themselves in the cell. And the way we eventually be able to cure them and we cure them today is really kind of exploiting the network aspects uh, and the interactions between the components. And that information will have to eventually come back uh, to the patient. So, so down the line, what I would like to, I, I personally deeply believe that network thinking is unavoidable and will be deeply infused into the way we think about human diseases in the uh, coming years and certainly decades. Thank you very much for your attention.